What's up everyone? I'm Nathan Graham Davis and I'm gonna re-break in as a Hollywood screenwriter. So we're gonna show the entire Clint Jones audience that I actually hit my head for real. <laughs> it's a Skillshare segment too. So it's a Skillshare, Skillshare sponsorship. And then I'm just gonna be doing this like freaking bloody head thing. <laughs> I think Is that it's okay? Great. Totally. <laughs> I think it's funny, dude. So uh, if you didn't catch Clinton Jones's YouTube live stream the other day where he did that whole head splitting effect on my head, yeah, I actually hit my head for real on my desk. I did like 10 takes of that shot and uh, none of them really looked good. So I kept pushing it further and faster until I went a little too far. So that's obviously the take that I had to use. You should definitely go over to Clint's channel at Punisher, check out how he did the whole thing. It's like five hours long, but even if you just kind of skip through it to see the magic at work there, it's insane, highly recommended. Clint is a super talented director, a VFX wizard, great friend of mine. We had an awesome conversation the other day just about art and writing and VFX and the commitment it takes to be great at anything. It was super cool. There's a ton I want to get into afterwards, so let's dive right in. All right, so should we start over like I, we didn't just do all that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, sorry, I didn't know it was like, boom. No, like... no worries, man. Um, you know, I don't know what the... Um, how, how these things are normally done. So I'm just figuring it out as I go, you know? So, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, what's got you so busy right now? Dude, um, man, three things. So we're moving into, into a new place. Um, I am working at Corridor full time and I'm also running my YouTube channel at the same time. So it's like, oh, and there's a couple freelance things too. So it's just like, <laughs> it's, it's so much, dude. It is so much like it's, it's, a lot to handle and I definitely feel like everything building um so it does sound I, like a lot. yeah I have to be very careful about what I do how I do it and you know I gotta gotta do a lot of yoga and working out to like you know stay sane well, and, that makes me uh, extra appreciative that you managed to squeeze this in so thank you very much um oh yeah dude anything what are you doing over at quarter right now so right now, um, we just finished a video called Tactical Three Loads. It's, uh, you know, kind of like a anime in real life buddy cop thing. Um, so it's very silly, very out there. We worked the last six months on that, um, trying to knock that thing out. No kidding. Yeah. How many so minutes do you get out of six months worth of work? I think that came down to like seven minutes wow. or so. Yeah, I mean, well, we shot that in Texas, right? So we shot that with the Black Rifle Coffee Company. Um, it's like a veteran-owned coffee company. We went out there. We shot with them um, and with Freddie Wong, right, um, who worked over – who started Rock Jump. And basically, we went for, I don't know, three days of filming, and we came back with a whole bunch of footage. And it just took a while to edit that footage together because there's a bunch of thing, different things going on at Corridor. Like, they released, like, a website – and everything so there's nice. working on that working on other things and then we got to do pickups and then we got to do reshoots and then you know we have to do all these vfx shots which there was like 80 vfx shots that i like headed up with the team and made sure all the shots were being taken care of and everything um so it was just yeah a whole bunch of stuff and i don't know i wouldn't say it was a short amount of time it, it felt long it felt like the, the project dragged on for a while just because there's so much but we eventually, you know, wrapped it up, got it done, and it feels good to put it out and, um, you know, be done with it and move on to the next thing. Awesome. So is that one out already or, or is it about to come out? It's out. Yeah, it's already okay. out. Okay. So I haven't seen this one yet. I'll definitely have to check that out. Yeah. So, uh, that's super wacky. cool. I'd, I'd love to get your, your opinion on it as a, as a writer. Like, it's definitely it's not anything too intricate. It's not anything too advanced um, when it comes down to writing. Like there, it's definitely dealing with two characters, two goofy characters. Um, and you know, it's kind of tropey and a little cliche, but I think that's kind of the point when Nico wrote it. Um, okay. Awesome. But yeah, we'll just have to see. 
Awesome. I can't wait to check that out. I'll definitely let you know what I think. Um, yeah. Then, so you're obviously working on your own channel. You're doing these VFX tutorials, which are really like, I actually, even though I know nothing about VFX, I watched a good chunk of one of them and like you go way in depth on this stuff um, and, and take it to yeah. the next level. Yeah. Um, I really, you know, I really enjoy doing VFX. I can do it in my spare time. I could just zone in and focus on it for hours and hours and hours. Uh, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, I, you know, every Saturday I run a live stream and I, you know, try to start with a task or um, some sort of goal and accomplish it by the end. And they can go up to five hours of just, you know, straight information. And I really like, I think it's cool because people who are fans of myself, like they can come and hang out and they can watch these streams for however long they want like they're just kind of running it's like saturday morning cartoons you know they go and if you're new to like 3d programs and stuff it's a really good way to hang out and also just learn as like i go you'll see like oh he's doing this he's doing that um and like the more you tune in the built like the more your knowledge base is built up over time and then you're able to finally jump in into your own thing that's super cool. It's been really cool. It's been a lot of hard work because there's a lot of prep stuff that like prep time that needs to go into making a stream actually be nice, you know, and like actually because it has to live as a standalone video after the fact too. It can't just be like, you know, I'm, I'm, count, I'm, I'm not counting on, but I want other people to watch it after I'm done streaming live too. So I just need to keep that in mind as well that like I can't just be hanging out, you know, with in the chat for hours it's got to be like you know kind of pointed and educational throughout the whole kind of process right. um for other people watching who aren't doing watching live after you know so you said you're doing some freelance stuff too um talk to me about that that's more just like helping friends out with vfx really okay. you know so yeah. what freelance stuff like when i'm asking you can you make my head explode and things like that yeah no exactly exactly so it's just like stuff for friends um okay and you know fun little projects on the side exactly well when i start hearing about everything that you're working on i i'm kind of feeling a little guilty for asking you for that so thank you very much because uh that's huge so oh no no i i think it's important to be able to like continue to work on the relationships that you want to you know basically work on like i know that i want to work with you for a long long time so you know i'm going to do what i can to work with you whether it's do it help you out with the vfx shot because i just know that later down the road like it's my way of like staying connected. We want to stay totally. connected. We're going like, to do something together at some point it's happening. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's honestly been one really cool thing about kind of diving back in. Um, but not just writing a script, kind of coming up with this idea of doing this web series and having to interview all of these people that, you know, I used to talk to all the time and haven't necessarily talked to in years. It's really great to reconnect. Um, you know, one thing that I kind of, realized is just an unfortunate side effect of life being so busy is it's very hard to stay in touch with friends unless you're almost like double dipping right like so mm. like my best friends are either runners uh who i run with or mountain bike with or uh colleagues or you know people <laughs> who are screenwriters or in the film business because i'm already doing those things and i'm so busy it's very hard to kind of carve out time elsewhere and still be devoted to my family at the same time, you know? So, uh, it's, it's been really cool to reconnect with people for sure. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, time management is certainly a thing that I am getting better at. Um, I feel like I, I used to, I used to, uh, you know, double book myself all the time. And I, I didn't have a calendar. I didn't really know anything about that. And I would say, yeah, to one thing. And then, yeah, to another thing. And then they would, Hey, are you coming? And I'd be like, Oh my God, I'm at this other place. I can't, you know? And that was just the worst. I hated that so much. But, um, at this point, yeah, it's basically all just work. You know, it's, it's barely any leisure time. God dang it. Gilbert, this little <laughs> bud, he keeps playing with this thing. Hold on. He loves this toy, you know? Of course he gets does. amped on this thing. Awesome. I'm going to try and hide it from him. Let's see if you can find it down here. Um, so, yeah, it's just like, I, I totally see what you're saying. Basically, all my friends are like VFX, filmmaking. Um, you know, some, some are like rock climbing and yoga and stuff. But like, it's mostly all built around filmmaking. And then we all kind of like branch out and do these like side hobbies and stuff. Right, right. 
Um, but it's, I think it's a way to get better. You know, you surround yourself with the people who like absolutely are just good people who are, are really good at what they do, hopefully better than you at what you're trying to get good at. So you can learn from them. Um, you know, and then you just grow as a person with the people you're surrounded by, which is super important. You know, you got to hang out with good people. For sure. Um, so, uh, I know that mo- I think a lot of people, if they looked at what you've done, I mean, yeah, you've got a hundred hundreds of millions of views on YouTube from the various things that you've put out over the years, right? Um, I think most people would look at that and say that you're a pretty successful guy. But I know that uh, you've got goals that are and aspirations that are far beyond where you're at right now. Talk to me about some of those and how you're focusing on those in the middle of everything that you're doing right now. Yeah, for sure. So I know that I want to do a feature one day, like no question about it. I want to do a feature. Um, or at least like a longer kind of series, you know, a long form something where I can follow characters over a long period of time, have arcs and like really dive into some more, um, there's a better word than things, (laughs) um, different themes that you don't really deal with in shorts. Um, so yeah, doing any, anything long form, my, my mind is set on a feature I know people are saying like, oh, you know, it's all about the shows now. Or it's all about YouTube now. It's like, nah, man, I want to do a feature. I want to do this legit. Like I'm constantly trying to challenge myself for, you know, bigger things and more challenging things. And I just find so much satisfaction and, and yeah, taking on those challenges and doing something over a longer period of time that takes dedication and effort and persistence and I just think that it's going to make you a better person in the end for me personally. So I, that's what I'm going for. Definitely. And things I'm doing to, you know, to work towards that. I mean, every single day, you know, I, I recently started getting up early five forty-five in the morning, um, get working out by six, um, planning my day out by six twenty, and then learning something new by six forty, so that by seven o'clock I'm like taken care of, you know, Um, and then I can jump into all the stuff that I need to do to move the needle forward. So basically, you know, in the mornings I'm working on, um, anything that like needs to be taken care of, like any little small projects that need to be knocked out so I can focus on, um, larger things or, uh, tutorials that I'm going to be like, I'm not always here on Saturday, so I can't always live stream. So, you know, I'll be working on shorts, uh, or not, sorry, not shorts small little tutorial episodes that I can post while I'm gone on Saturday. Right. So just so something continues to drop every single Saturday. Yeah. Cause that's like the biggest thing is consistency and staying consistent with things. Um, and I realized like that is really it. You know, you have to be persistent and you have to be consistent with like everything that you're doing if you want to get better at it. And if you want to see any sort of like growth or change, you have to like, be really, really disciplined and work hard to, you know, put in the points, basically spend your skill points in certain areas. And over time, you're going to look back and be like, Whoa, I I got better. This grew, you know? Yeah. Um, You said move the needle. And I think that's really it, right? It's like day to day. It's hard to see the, the progress in the space of a single day, but you know, if you spread that out, out over a few weeks or a few months or a few years, I mean, it can be massive if you're just chunking away at it every single day. You know, it's like coming from uh, the banking world, I really think of it like compounding interest. You know, I mean, that's, that's the exact same way that works. It's, you know, you, you may not notice a lot in a year, but you do that over a long period of time and the results can be enormous. Um, so, uh, but it's, it all comes down to that discipline. So it's cool to hear that you've kind of got this really strong routine in place. Um, that's kind of keeping you grounded there when you're talking about minor stuff that you're knocking out in the mornings, what's that type of thing? Um, so, um, right. Currently I'm helping out a friend with a short film. So I'm trying to knock out those VFX shots in the morning. Um, you know, if it's, if it's something like, uh, a tutorial that I'm putting together for Saturday, you know, I will basically write it, brainstorm it and just put work into it for like an hour, whatever, whatever step of the way that needs to be accomplished. Like I'll do that for an hour or so. Um, what else, you know, I hadn't been doing this recently, but I would, uh, 
write for an hour every morning before work. And I would spend that hour or part of that hour writing. And I got to the point where I had like four or five short films that I came up with um, in that hour over a course of five months or so. Wow. I'm just bad at writing, dude. I, I, it takes me so long to write. Um, it, it's a really difficult process. I was talking to a friend about this yesterday, how like it's definitely like my weakest area and it's so much harder because I'm not that good at it. And it's frustrating because I'm not that good at it and it's very slow and I just have to have that patience when I'm, you know, when I'm writing. And, it, you know, it's, it's easier when you're good at something and, and you're like Kobe or you're like, uh, you know, Michael Jordan and you can just float and fly through the thing you love doing. But when it's something you know you need to get better at and you're not good at it, it's really difficult. So, well, even you know, though, I, um, you know, there's this book that I read called Relentless a while back. Um, and it was by the guy who trained Michael Jordan and, Co- and Kobe. And, uh, and he talked about the insane amount of work that like they, they were always the people who were there at the gym earlier than anybody else and later than anybody else, even though they were the most talented, you know, on the court, they put so much effort into their game. And I think, um, you know, that's really inspiring to know that even people at the absolute top, you know, have to work really hard for that. Absolutely. It's what like sets them apart from everybody else is that they're like dedicated to working hard and training hard. And like, that's, that's just what has to be done to be the best. And is, is it that coach? What's yeah. the coach's name? Yeah. Uh, hold on. I got the book here. It's Tim something. One second. It's Tim Grover. So that's the book. Um, oh, nice. And uh, it's, it's interesting because it's like he really kind of um, a big theme running through it is that you really need to tap into your dark side to be successful sometimes, which is a little bit uncomfortable. Um, mm. And uh, but, I, you know, as I did some thinking about that, I don't necessarily disagree with it. Um, you know, so for me. I was like bullied like crazy as a little kid. Um, It was really bad for years and years and years. And I think what I did was uh, just as a result kind of developed this real chip on my shoulder um, where I felt like I needed to prove myself uh, throughout Mm. my entire life um, in whatever it is that I'm doing and just be the best at whatever it is that I'm doing. And that has been something that's kind of just been with me. And I never really thought about it until I started kind of, actually reading that and saying, you know, is, is that true for me? And, you know, so for me, it's like, I mean, I certainly don't consider myself a darker evil person, you know, um, and I certainly don't want to step on anybody in order to move forward in my own life. But tapping into that chip on my shoulder uh, is not necessarily a bad thing if it's, you know, keeping me focused and driving me forward. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Oh, no, totally. Um, I think, um, I was watching the, what is it? The, the last dance. Did you see that documentary? The Michael Jordan documentary? Uh, no. Oh my God. I don't God. even know it's, what that is actually. It is so good. It's on Netflix. Um, the last oh, dance. Oh man. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. It is like, it is so good. Um, absolutely incredible. And there's a moment where like they talk about, uh, I think Michael Jordan, like he would do whatever he had to do to like, to win the game. Right. Right. So he had to just dig deep and find these things that like took him to the next level. And sometimes it would be that darker side, right. That you're talking about. And he would like pinpoint certain players on the opposite team and just like target them, you know, and he would use that or, or any, uh, he was very competitive. So like someone on the opposite team would score a certain amount of points and they'd be like, Oh, you know, like, this right. Player that would just set him points. off. Completely. Yeah. And it set him off and he would just be like, I am going to destroy you. And he would just use that to like win the next game, you know? So yeah, um, Tim Grover talked about uh, an incident just like that. And I guess like the player that talked shit to Michael and set him off, uh, got benched for like the next few games or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, get this guy off the court. Like, don't, yeah. don't, don't anger Michael. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty funny stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about that and um, kind of, you know, what the things that actually drive us and, and move us forward, for sure. And just the amount of 
constant work uh, and dedication it takes to achieve something. And, you know, so for me, with screenwriting in particular, I had really done that for, you know, seven years and then I broke in and then I stuck with it a couple more years and then I walked away from it. And so it's kind of crazy, um, you know, in hindsight, like, what was I thinking? I put all that effort in and really, you know, I got up at 4.30 a.m. or whatever and, and did the work and got it done. And, and I actually, I, I did break in and then, um, and then I kind of just let it go away because I, I got so tired of, you know, all of the frustrating bullshit that came along with that. And I was a little too naive to, to realize that that wasn't, or that that was just a normal part of getting movies made. Right. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm kind of getting back to it and, uh, you know, ready to dive back in and, and go all out. Um, but, uh, yeah, Dude, that's so exciting. Like it, I'm, well, good. Answering, man. it's good to hear you say that. Cause part of me is like, ah, oh, you know, six years that I just, I could have been working at it and I'd be so much further along and so much better now, you know? Um, and it's not like I didn't do any writing, but I just, I, I focused my energy elsewhere. So. Well, I feel very, very, very similar in the sense that like, you know, I have my Punisher channel on YouTube. I started YouTube literally when YouTube started, like right when it began. Right. Yeah. You were and like, you know, I, I had a successful YouTube channel for a while and then, um, you know, I signed on to rocket jump. I basically moved all my focus into another area. And I'm not saying I regret, you know, going to Rocket Jump or, um, you know, obviously I'm at Quarter right now, but like I shifted my focus. I, I was focusing on my, you know, my own channel, my own stuff, and I shifted it elsewhere. And like, it feels good now. Like, obviously I'm still at Quarter, but it feels good to take my free time and work on my YouTube channel. You know, I'm kind of coming back to it and it feels, it feels great. It feels like I was neglecting that. And it was like, no, I just need to like, kind of get disciplined and focus on my personal stuff and grow that over time. Just get started so that like it will grow and grow and grow. Um, And it feels good. Yeah. And so that again, like I am excited for you. I'm very excited to like, I think, I think we're kind of like, we're, we're both like kind of doing very similar things together, you know, trying to build up and get back in and stuff. So it's cool. And and that's, um, you know, one thing that I think is so important, right? Like is always to, to just have that, that because this can be such a lonely journey uh, when you're mm-hmm. in it by yourself and just to have that network of people who are kind of all in the trenches with you and just be able to share those experiences and, and bounce ideas off of each other. And so that's super cool. Uh, by the way, speaking to, you know, so you said writing is like something that's a real challenge for you. You know, I feel like you were just dipping your toe into that kind of as I started doing other things. And so I would assume that you probably feel you're a better writer now than you were then though, right? Cause you did. Quite certainly. A yeah, certainly. Like I, it's definitely a muscle that needs to be continually worked on, but in terms of like theory and like w- where the bar needs to be set, like my bar has been raised. Certainly. Like I've been to um, me and my girlfriend actually, or fiance at this point, uh, we went to, eight. Congratulations, yeah. dude. When Thanks, did that dude. happen? Like last weekend. What? No <laughs> way. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, man. Yeah, we're super excited. We're very, very excited. It's going to be cool. That's but, um, cool. We, t- we went to uh, a Robert McKee story seminar together. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah. And it was on comedy, I think. Yeah, it was comedy. So, you know, I, I got his book story right here, dialogue right here, um, a bunch of other, you know, books on screenwriting yeah, got, and got my tattered oh, copy here. So I take off the sleeve of all my stuff, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. Story's really good. You know, it's, um, it's funny. I, uh, I mentioned that in my first episode and just kind of, it's pretty dense, but like, there's so much great information on structure and narrative. You know, it's not the Bible. Um, you know, some things are not going to work for every single writer and every single story, but yeah. it's got a lot of good information in it for sure. Yep. So, I mean, my, I, I, I'm informed, I'm informed, but it is, it has, um, it's not being put into practice every single day, which is something that I'm a little bummed about, but I can only focus on so much right at one time yeah absolutely <laughs> and that's why like i want to like collaborate with you is because you're you're putting all of your your points into this area and like i certainly feel like i need to put points in that area but maybe not all of my points i just need to know like what's good what's not good enough 
um, what I, what I'm looking for, um, who I want to work with, like that kind of stuff I feel like is the most important thing. And then from there, when it comes to like collaboration, you know, that's when you kind of get more into it. And it's like, well, like, let's focus on the characters. I don't think our characters are figured well, out enough, you know, that kind of stuff. But I think what's cool is you being informed in that way. It just makes you such a stronger director, right? Because it, you know, that way, when you're reading a script, you're seeing it with different eyes than you would be if, if you hadn't put all that effort into understanding the writing process, right? And so, you know, one thing that happens sometimes is directors will make changes while shooting or even in pre-production that are really bad for the overall story because, like, it creates a cool moment, but, like, it has effects elsewhere in the, in the story that are a real problem. And so I feel like you putting all this effort into writing is going to allow you to make much stronger choices in that type of way. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Yeah. I think the more, the more, you know, um, yeah. especially so, if it's like, I think writing is like one of the most important things. Um, if not the most important thing, because it comes first and that is like basically your template for, or your foundation really for like everything else you do. Um, so if that's not solid, and the production begins, you're kind of in a place where it's like, we have to fix all this stuff as the production is rolling. The train has been like the, 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 the boat has set sail and we cannot stop it. Um, and, but we have this like janky boat that we have to fix, you know, while we're out at sea. And it's like, no, if you go out with a real solid boat, like you might have to do some repairs, but like, it's going to be fine. Versus, yeah, I think that's a great analogy. You know, yeah. I was just talking to Bob Sines the other day. And uh, he's a writer that's got like 16 produced credits, right? And one thing that keeps on uh, getting him work is that he really understands everything to do with production because he has a lot of kind of lower key acting experience where he's, you know, been a day player and things like that. Um, and so he's been on set a lot and really understands the different roles because he just talks to people while he's there. He understands budgeting really well, a lot better than many other writers do. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'm listening to that and I'm like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. And what you were just talking about reminds me of that because here you are, you're investing time in really understanding the writing process, right? Even if like, you know, you may not be writing your own scripts for your own movies for a long time, or that might even not be something that you do period but just understanding that process makes you so much stronger. And so for me, I'm like, all right, well, I don't live in LA right now. So there are a very limited number of sets that I can get on. Um, but I feel like I do need to do some things to help me just understand movie making better than I do, because that will allow me to write better scripts. Do you have any advice on how I might be able to do that without being able to get on set a whole lot? So you're asking like what roles could you better understand to write better scripts? Yeah. Um, you know, in what aspects of movie making do you feel like maybe get overlooked um, by screenwriters sometimes? Well, I guess the first like obvious thing would be budget, right? It's yeah. like if, if you can, I mean, in, you know, you, you've, you've written a few features. Um, okay. I've read a couple of them and you had budget in mind with, with those features. Um, so I'd say budget is the first thing that like writers should keep in mind and think about is like, can this be done reasonably? The I think the more you can like visualize and see it in your head, the better it'll come out. Um, that's so like, I'm yeah. Like I'm very visual and I have to imagine things. So like, that's why I love listening to ambient music so much is because it just puts me like in a visual headspace and I'm just like, yeah. I can like feel and and see these images and these things that like inspire me and then i can write so the more you can see something um the more real it becomes and then you can actually you know write it out and stuff yeah that's so true and um i think that's something that actually developed as i got better as a writer you know i learned to really see the movie and when a scene wasn't working i would just kind of step back and really try and visualize it as much as possible. And a lot of times that just opened up new possibilities that weren't there before, you know, and, and made it work a whole lot better. So that's a cool point. And I think it's on point. Um, so back to budget, like what are kind of some of the key things to keep in mind for that? 
you know, I, I feel like I understand some of them, right? So like number of characters is really important. Number of sets um, or, or locations is really important, um, obviously. And that's why, you know, a contained thriller with three people is pretty solid because- The first Saw movie. <laughs> you make that cheap, you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, so other things have changed. Like for instance, the, the stuff that you do with VFX is insane. Like it's absolutely insane that you can do that yourself, right? And I don't feel like I, could, I have a good grasp on what types of effects can be done for cheap and how big you can go for cheap. I mean, obviously somebody like you, um, like there's a cost to that if somebody's hiring somebody like you to help them make a movie for sure. But it seems like it's a whole lot faster now than it used to be and therefore less expensive. Yeah, because a lot more people are doing it and all the the knowledge and info is more accessible. Like, I mean, there's kids like 13, 14, 15, you know, in Blender learning how to do stuff. So, you know, they're going to grow up. A lot of them are going to grow up to be really, really talented VFX artists and and maybe directors and, you know, whatever. Um, so you're going to see more and more of that. Like it is more accessible. I don't know how good the quality will be or how professional a 15 or 16 year old is going to be if you hire them. Um, but I mean, it's definitely something to keep in mind though, when you're writing is visual effects. Certainly, you know, you can't just say, you know, like the alien spaceship, uh, you know, bombs the city and then a, a new spaceship like emerges from the center of this. It's like, you, I mean, you, you can write that. I mean, having it come to fruition will be ex really expensive unless you're going to learn how to do it yourself. So, um, so VFX are still expensive then there's no getting around that. For sure. Yeah. Good VFX are very expensive. Very, very expensive. Like it takes t so much time. That's like at the end of the day, that's just what it takes. It takes a lot of time. And if you're having someone do your effects who like know what they're doing and have done a whole bunch of different jobs and stuff, like they know that like this takes so much time. And if you want like the craft up to a certain level, the quality level, then like it's going to be expensive for sure. So let, an example that probably a lot of people watching this will have seen, you did this video where there was this robot at this firing range, right? Uh, yeah. And it went really viral. Um, I think partially because some people weren't sure whether it was real or not. I mean, it looked that good, right? Yeah. So that was, I don't know, how long was that? Like a three minute video or something like that? Yeah, something like that. So three minutes of that level of VFX where, you know, it's one little character, but it looks real. If somebody put that into a script that was otherwise, you know, contained, is that reasonable for a budget or is it so time consuming that it's going to be expensive no matter what to get that type of effect in there? Um, it is pretty time consuming. So just to put it in perspective, that was boss town dynamics two, And that was myself, Ren and a little bit of Sam, the three of us for about three months on that. Um, so I, you guys had been charging, you know, so if, if some producer came to you and said, Hey, we need you three guys to do this effect for us and we want three months of your life. So that would be expensive. Yeah. No way around it. Certainly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, with, with three people for three months, that's probably what a hundred thousand dollar plus effect. Yeah. So, yeah. Like it, it's, um, yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly a balance, you know, cause like, you can learn how to do that certain you can certainly learn how to do that with blender because blender's free and there are some pretty reasonable like motion capture suits that you can buy the rococo motion capture suit is one that's um pretty popular the affordable version right um mm -hmm. and you know you follow enough tutorials you you might be able to get that done in a year if you focus really hard and like and actually learn the things, follow the tutorials, you can probably get it done in a year. So that's why I'm always trying to learn as much as I can when it comes to creating. Like, I don't want to have to be like beholden to anybody else to do something that I can't do. Um, so the whole reason I got into visual effects is because I, if I could like, 
you know, all the technical knowledge aside, if I could think it in my head, I could create it, you know, from scr- from scratch, you know, and if so- I'm, yeah. And like, if I'm good enough and if I know how to use the programs, like I can do that. So I should probably learn how to do that. Um, it opens up my storytelling ability times 10. I, you know, I can tell a story on Mars. I can tell a story on the moon. I can tell a story like with a robot um, because, you know, just put in some time to learn visual effects and have always stuck with it. And one of my goal, one of my life goals is to keep, keep up with it. You know, um, it can easily get out of hand. And I think, you know, the, the further we get into the future, the more technology will escape us. And I feel a little bit of a pressure right now to learn well, unreal engine right now is like kind of the thing I'm trying to learn. Yeah. I remember you saying you were interested in more than that. It's, it's so complicated. It is so complicated and like so (laughs) deep. It's so deep. But again, like the hour of, you know, writing in the morning, maybe it's an hour of unreal engine in the morning. So it's just a matter of like where I want to spend my points and stuff. Man, I think Da Vinci resolve is complicated. So like, I've been watching all these videos just to learn little steps and things like that. And you know, it's working like I'm learning stuff, but it is time consuming. And so you know, that's probably super basic compared to the stuff that you're playing around in. So I can't even imagine. It's a, I mean, it is similar in the sense that like, it's a big, it's a new program that has a lot of buttons. Yeah, it does. And you just got to learn what the buttons do for the things you're trying to accomplish. That's really it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's cool though. And I I appreciate you recommending it. I mean, it, it can easily handle anything that I'm going to need to accomplish. So yeah, it's great. So it's a pretty cool program for sure. And I appreciate that recommendation. Um, so what do you think makes a cinematic movie idea? Oh man. Um, something with stakes and drama. Um, something that, I mean, there's so many different things. There's like the what if movie. Um, like any like near sci-fi kind of things. Um, right, narrow it down for you to make it easier. Um, and maybe you'll be able to feel like you can give um, a yeah. solid answer on it. Um, so, so what do you think makes like an idea cinematic in a way that you're like, I want to do this movie? Well, for me, I don't want to see anything that's too cliche like i am so like i just glaze over when i see most anything nowadays it's just very very cliche and i've seen it a million times or it's like it's too serious and it's it's just it's so serious like where's the comedy you know like there needs to be some um you know some jokes in here at some point you know saving private ryan has moments of, of right comedy we were talking it. about that yeah and, yeah uh, and did you ever watch hotel rwanda to see that moment that i was telling you about no not yet yeah, it's i mean just because it's exactly what we were talking about there's this it's this really dark and intense movie and there's this moment of comedy right kind of t- moving toward the third act that it's just so needed and it makes it so much stronger so, yeah people are looking for a chance to just like let off some steam for a second especially in a serious movie um but yeah i know for for me like i love like Ed, edgar wright is incredible oh, yeah, um for sure he's so good like he really does such a good and, and stephen chow stephen chow i feel like is the the chinese oh, version of edgar wright and, and stephen chow's not really making movies anymore but he is probably i mean he's top five favorite directors no doubt for sure um because he combines drama like serious drama like people's lives are at stake here, hostage situations, you know, whatever. But he combines it with comedy and like fantasy and just ridiculousness. Yeah. I mean, physical sometimes comedy. He, it gets absurd. Like some of his comedy is like really on that absurd level. Like, so, I love that. I love that so much. Um, yeah. It doesn't it surprise me at all considering the type of stuff that you make. Yeah, all. man. It has everything. Like, my my friend said it best. His name is Young, um, Young Lee, and he was like, "I'm gonna, I might butcher this, but he's like, and I think it's a quote from some somebody else, but it was like, I want to make a movie that blows the mind, soothes the soul, like, um, 
pleases pleases the ears and um like makes you cry or something like it has like everything basically it's like everything into one and like that's just that's like a full complete like toy story you know it has everything you know Um, yeah i mean pixar just nails that almost every time they're incredible good so good Uh, you know and, and it really does it all i mean they have um their their movies are breathtakingly beautiful and super well acted and everything but at the end of the day every single one of those stories is just incredible and it's layered and it's deep and it moves and it's 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 always interesting yeah i mean they really they kill it yeah but like recently you know like i saw extraction and i'm like did you see that movie no i didn't um that's a chris hemsworth one right yeah yeah it's just it's just so serious and I've seen this story a million times and like, you know, as a, as a, um, a stunt, uh, what is it? Stunt guy, like a coordinator, stunt coordinator directed that movie. And um, it's just like, you know, heavily focused on the action and you know, it's man, even Jackie Chan's early movies and like rush hour, rush hour is like the best, but like you have any of his older movies, from like the nineties, like who am I or Mr. Nice guy or whatever. And like those stories aren't that good. Most Kung Fu movie stories aren't that good. Right. You're there for the action, you know, but why not have really good action in a really good story at the same, you have, why not have both? And yeah. I just feel like Absolutely. so many of these movies are just hitting like one note. They're, they're, they're doing the minimum amount for the story, but then it's like, Oh, it's specializing in the action. It's like, you got to hit on all cylinders to be special, you know, to, to, you know, shine above the other ones, the other cliche movies or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think it will come to story. Story is like, if you can just do story with some good actors, like you're solid, you don't have to have the fancy action or that's all extra, you know? So, you know, it's interesting because my question, I think I was more curious about, you know, what makes a core idea something that's exciting to you? But you're talking about like, for you, it's really the, the core idea is just part of it, but you want, you know, a story that's going to take an audience through, you know, a roller coaster of emotions and that's going to have a lot of breadth and allow you to do a lot of different and interesting things. I think that's, that'd be the most satisfying and the most fun to do. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to just like an idea, I don't know. Like it, I don't know. Like, let's say you have an idea and I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking about it. And if my first, if the sound, it's like the sound I make. If it's like, Oh, okay. You know, or like, Oh, nice. Versus like, eh, eh, you know, um, the difference between those two, man, I don't know. That's like, that's like scientific, man. That's yeah. I mean, it, it's really hard to get an answer. But I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I haven't decided what it is that I'm writing yet. Um, yeah. you know, I wanted to spend like these first kind of three weeks just really immersing myself in uh, screenwriting again. You know, I've been listening to just a ton of podcasts. I've read a new book. I've been doing these interviews. Um, I've been building out, you know, this, this writer's studio up here just to kind of have like a really cool place to work, which has been very satisfying. Um, you know, but I'm about ready to get going. And um, I'm just trying to zero in on, on what it should be that I write next. And I think I've definitely determined at this point after, you know, the last couple of conversations I've had and plus this one with you that I'm going to do another script that's in a, you know, low budget range, uh, at least below 10 million, probably below five. Yeah. Nice. And I'll probably do something. So I've got continuum and then I've got um, and continuum is that contained sci-fi thriller. And then I've got, totally aftermath which it, the option has lapsed so i at least own it again and it's a marketable script and that's an action thriller that's also a little bit contained um you know so i want something that's going to kind of fit there where maybe it's not exactly either of those but if somebody sees those three scripts from me it kind of feels like the same it's obvious that the same writer might have written those things does that make sense totally yeah but, it's in the same kind of zero in on, on what that's going to be so and it's, it's tough uh, because I, I think if you don't start with a great idea, you're just throwing months of your life away, you know, like it's um, at this point, at your point, at your point, certainly. Yeah. I mean, you can't make 
Right, that's true. Like when you start out, like most likely your first script isn't going to have a great idea to it, but you're still going to learn a lot from the process. No question. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say that was true at least about my first two um, and also my fourth. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, anyway, you know, I think you can't make a great movie without a great script and you can't make a great script without a great idea. And so it all starts there. And so I'm planning to put just a couple weeks of effort into just generating ideas and, and drawing log lines and characters from those ideas and trying to come up with something good. Um, but, you know, curious if you have any thoughts on that and, uh, you know, ways to narrow my focus a little bit. I mean, I think, I think that's a great idea. Um, a lot of people tend to just kind of go with the first idea that they think is like a good idea. But if you can just, you know, blast uh, your computer with as many ideas you can uh, for a couple of weeks, I think you'll definitely come out with like two, three. Yeah, like exactly. Really That's solid. Kind of goal, you know, like I figure if I make myself come up with 10 movie ideas a day for a week, right? That's 70. And then if I take those and, you know, from every group of 10, write three log lines, then, you know, I'll have 21 log lines for the next week. And then from those, I should be able to come up with something good, I hope, um, you know, but uh, it's that whole blank page thing. It's tough to get started, you know, and, and so narrowing yeah. the focus there is, is important. I was um I was watching a tutorial on I think concept art mm -hmm. um and creating like you know CG landscapes and they were saying how you you have to keep iterating on your concept art like you have to sketch it out quickly and then change it and then change it and then change it and come up with another one and then change it and just basically come up with like all these different versions of like your initial idea and how important that is like it's so important. It's basically your first idea is not the best idea. You need to just keep, you know, iterating on different versions of that idea that's until true. you have something that's like really nice. And you're like, this is it. Now I'm going to spend my time on this as opposed to spending all this time on your first idea just because it's convenient or you think it's good. Like there can be better, you know? It's so true. And, you know, in the whole writing process is that way. And really, I guess the whole movie making process, right? So it's like, you know, you get that idea, but now you're going to outline it. And you're probably going to continue throwing out parts of that and putting in new parts. And then you're going to write the first draft of the script and you're going to find that 40% of that outline is useless. And you know, you're going to be creating new things and then you're going to get feedback on that from friends or whatever. And you'll find that there's a big plot hole in this character sucks and whatever. So then you do a massive rewrite again and another massive rewrite. You know, for me, it's usually four drafts before it's really solid. Um, and then you go and make the movie and you're doing pre-production and production and then editing. And sometimes there's reshoots and yeah, I mean, it's just never ending. It's crazy when you think about all of the rehashing to take you from start to finish of a really great film. Yeah, certainly. Um, and it kind of gives me hope that a lot of, you know, the really, really good movies had that too, you know? So it's not just the, you do the best with the time that you're given, um, certainly. And those writers did their best and they, they still had to be tweaked a little bit here and there, you know? Um, but so then, you know, there's just some people who like everything they write is just so good. Like Aaron Sorkin, I'm a big fan of Aaron Sorkin and oh, he's just incredible. Um, I'm just so in like, am I, am I in or am I out? when I watch a movie and with all of his movies and like uh, David Fincher, I'm just, I'm always in, you know, yeah, yeah, I never so get social network the way. where oh, those man. two came together. I think that's easily one of the best movies since 2000. Um, yeah. You know, and with the, with the um, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Oh doing my God. Music right. Too. Yeah. I mean, just all these elements, you know, coming together um, and just making it incredible. I listen to that soundtrack when I write sometimes, you know, it's just that good. Yeah, um, it's the girl with dragon tattoo soundtrack and like um, yeah, totally um, incredible. Yeah, Reznor, like it's funny. I wasn't really that into Nine Inch Nails as a same kid, but same. I listen to them all the time now um, when I'm writing. Um, even some of the stuff that that has vocals, I can it's which is uncommon for me. 
I can have that on while I'm writing it and still get into a zone. Usually vocals trip me up and I can't write with them, but uh, Nine Inch Nails just, and, and all of his movie scores and everything. I mean, he's amazing. Yeah, he's so good. I can't wait. I don't know what he's doing next. I usually don't really look into it, but whatever um, David Fincher comes out with next, I'm very excited. Yeah, always, always on board for Fincher. Well, listen, I know um, you've got a really packed schedule right now, so I, I don't want to take up a lot more of your time, but this has been uh, super cool to connect. I really appreciate it. really appreciate you know, all the advice that you've been giving me um, to help me out with this. So thank you so much for that. Um, any additional advice as I'm kind of trying to get back on this crazy roller coaster again? And... Yeah, um, just stick with it. Yeah, just... that's pretty much it, right? And take breaks stick. when you can. Like, I mean, you run a lot. Are you still running? Yeah. Well, I have a lot of questions for you on that. So maybe that's the next chat. Sounds, we have. Right. Sounds good. We'll connect on running for sure. Yeah, awesome. but yeah, keep it up, man. Will do. So, hey, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Good luck with everything you got going on. Thanks, Nate. You too, man. So you see someone like that who puts so much intention into every single day and into continually improving their craft. And you get it, right? Like you're not going to watch that conversation and then wonder why Clint's successful or doubt whether he's going to go on to do big things. I mean, he works full time at Quarter Digital, and yet he still gets up early every single morning and he devotes time to improving his skills and to learning new things. And he does these multi-hour live streams on Saturdays, which I know require a ton of prep in advance. And in the middle of all of that, he finds time for his fiance and for running and for yoga and for meditation. It's awesome. For my part, I've been getting up at 4.30 a.m. every single morning, including weekends, for the last several weeks, with only a couple exceptions. My methods for staying disciplined have definitely evolved over the last few years, just like Clint's but I thought I'd share a couple of them with you now. Something I've been doing consistently for a long time is scheduling out my ideal week. Again, this is my ideal week. Things happen almost every single week, but having this schedule in place really helps me focus my priorities. I just redid this because I just recommitted myself to screenwriting and I'm doing this whole YouTube thing. And so I still need to find a lot of time for my family and for my job and for my fitness. Those things do take time, and the only way that i found to manage all of that is to have a plan. But things happen, and I know that. And I know that if I want to hit the equivalent of about 20 pages a week, I'm going to need to build in a couple extra hours. Same thing goes for reentry. That way, if something comes up, I'll still be able to hit that goal and get the work done. Finally, this plan allows me time to watch a couple movies every week, read a couple scripts, and knock out a book every month or so. you got to keep consuming art if you want to keep creating it. So yeah, that's how I schedule things. And then there's this ever-present, sadistic, evil force known as procrastination. And to be honest, it's taken me a long time to get any sort of handle on this. I'm still learning, but one thing that has seriously helped me for the last couple years is something that I picked up from Andy Frisella. If you don't know who Andy is, he's this super successful businessman and entrepreneur. I don't know him personally, but he's run this podcast for a few years called the MF CEO Project. Just a fair warning, he's super abrasive and not for everyone, and I don't agree with everything he says, but his content on success strategies and discipline is just, it's pure gold. So anyway, every morning for the last couple of years, first thing I've done is I've journaled for 20 minutes, and then I've written down my power list. It looks like this. It's that simple. And this simple tool has helped me achieve more than I thought possible during that time and it's also the reason that I am 100% confident that I'm going to be able to break back into Hollywood. I will link to Andy's podcast in the show notes because he can explain it a whole lot better than I can. But here's the deal. It's about winning the day. It's about gaining momentum. It's about just moving the needle forward like Clint and I were talking about. So you've got five critical tasks. These things are proactive. They're not routine. They're not habit. There are things that take willpower, like run three miles or write three pages. And there are things that you have total control over, right? So I'm not just going to write down, oh, I'm going to get reps today because I don't control whether somebody's going to rep me or not. But what I do have control over is whether or not I'm going to write three pages that day or send out 10 personalized queries that day. I can own all of that, right? If you cross all five things off your list, you write a W and you circle it. You just won your day. If you miss any of them, 
by even a small margin for any reason, you write an L and you circle that because you just lost. Win more days in a week than you lost, you won the week. Win more weeks in a month than you lost, you won the month. Win more months in a year, you get the picture. For me, my first four tasks are different every single day because I have so many different things going on. My fifth is something that's a routine, so it starts with an R and then a number after it because I'm trying to do each routine for 30 days. That's about how long it takes for it to really become a habit. Right now, what I'm trying to do is to get used to going to bed at 10 p.m. every night so that I can get up at 4.30 and still have the energy to win my day. If I get to bed at 10.01, that's a loss. Up top, I just keep track of how many days into my year I am. So you see I'm on day 43 because I started this on a random day in August two years ago. And then you'll see that I've won 36 of the 42 days that I've completed and I've lost six of them. Not quite the ratio I want, but definitely a winning record that's keeping me moving forward. This is how I'm gonna stay focused on my family and kill it at my day job and stay physically fit and write a polished spec script in six months and document the entire thing. And this is how I'm gonna do that even on the days where I'm feeling like crap or feeling overwhelmed or just have a headache or whatever. Look, I know this is all insanely type A and if you're doing this whole screenwriting thing along with me, I'm not saying that you have to do this exactly, but you do need to stay disciplined. You do need to be committed. This is the NFL of writing, like I was saying last week. And if you don't put the work in, well, there are plenty of other people who will. So this is episode three, which means I'm about to leave behind the weeks where I've just been easing back into things. And I'm about to actually start generating ideas for the next couple. There's no point in spending six months of my life on a shitty idea. I've been thinking about the type of ideas that I wanna write. I know that I wanna go below that $10 million range, probably sub five. And I also know that I want to create a brand that allows producers and execs to peg the type of writer I am, but that doesn't box me into some corner where I don't have room to breathe as an artist. So here it is. I write thrillers that explore the conflicting nature inside all of us, and I do this through grounded, fast-paced stories that often have a subtle sci-fi or fantasy element. I've got a couple scripts that are ready to go right in that vein. I've got another that's probably a rewrite or two away from being there. And when I've got this next script ready to go, I'm going to have a small arsenal that's ready to help me make some moves. So on that note, action steps for week three. Read a script. Read a script from another writer and give them the best notes you can. I've read a few over the last couple weeks and I want to give shout outs to Mike Morin, Michael Horrigan, and Adam Barker, all of whom impressed the hell out of me. Number two, finish that book. Next week is all about idea generation, so finish it up and get ready to roll. Number three, find a method to stay disciplined. Check out the link to Andy Frisella's podcast in the show notes and see if that works for you. I want to send a huge shout out and a thank you to Clint Jones. Thank you so much for doing that hilarious head explosion at the beginning. Absolutely blew my mind. I loved it. Definitely check out Clint's work at Punisher as well as at Quarter Digital and Rocket Jump. You are going to love that. I promise. Also, big congrats to Gary Chen. You've got an autographed copy of Malice and Mistletoe on its way to you now and... I'm gonna be giving away another one this week. To win an autographed copy of Mouse and Mistletoe signed by Jack Purcell and by myself, all you gotta do is subscribe and then comment below what you're doing to stay disciplined. That's it, I'll pick one of you and put a book in the mail. Next week's all about idea generation. I'm gonna be talking to showrunner Malcolm Spellman about that and about plenty of other things, so be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. That's all I've got for this week, everyone. Thank you so much for checking this out. If there's anything that you wanna see or any questions you have, Drop it below in the comments. Smash cut to black. <laughs>